The database includes full historical listings of women who have held office at the congressional statewide elected executive and state legislative levels nationwide. While COP has long kept an office holder database, this is the first time it is available in a searchable online format for public access. It contains entries for more than 11,000 women office holders dating back to 1893 when women first served in territorial legislatures. We are grateful to Pivotal Ventures, an investment and incubation company founded by Melinda Gates for their vision and their support of our research. This database would not have been possible without their commitment and generosity. I also wanna quickly thank our colleague Pooja Prabhakaran for coordinating all of our public programs, including this webinar, and for the beautiful graphics she designed for the rollout of this database. You can find and share them on our social media accounts. I also want to thank our communication specialist, Daniel DeSimone, for all of his ex efforts for a successful rollout. If you are a journalist and you have more questions about the database after today, you can reach out to Daniel directly, and he will be glad to field your questions to the, to the appropriate person. I will post his email in our Q&A section, but you can also find it on the site. Finally, this database would not have been possible without the work of many of our current and former colleagues, too many to name. But a very, very special thank you to Gilda Morales, our information service services coordinator for many, many years, who oversaw the early work that made today's database possible. Gilda also established a fund to support students working at COP on data collection efforts. So again, a very, very special thank you to you, Gilda. I also want to thank our colleague, Linda Phillips, for her technical help and support on this database, and another former staffer, Kathy Kleeman, who also started a fund to support COP's work. I'm about to introduce my colleagues, Kelly Dittmar and Chelsea Hill, who will walk you through the database and some of its key features. But first, if you have a question during the program, please type it in the Q&A box. You'll see it on the right-hand side of your screen, or if you're watching this on an app, you'll see it in the three dot menu button at the bottom. I will field questions during the webinar and also during the Q&A portion at the end. So now let me introduce Chelsea Hill. Chelsea Hill is COP's data services manager who oversees the collection and organization of current and historical information about women's political participation. And she is actually the person who has done the lion's share of the work that made this database a reality. In a minute, she'll start walking you through an overview, but I also wanna introduce Kelly Dittmar, a COP scholar and our director of research. She is also an assistant professor of political science at Rutgers Camden. So now Chelsea will walk us through an overview of the database and Kelly will cover some of the details that are most helpful to scholars and researchers, including saving searches and exporting the data. So now Chelsea, I'll turn it over to you. And I think you might be muted, Chelsea. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Uh, thanks, Jean. Thank you, everyone, for uh, participating today. Um, so I am just going to take you through um, a basic overview of our database, and I'm going to start uh, with our homepage. You'll see here that we have a number of different search interfaces that you can choose from. Um, and this is our, our main search up here. Um, you can search, as it says, by name, position, level, or state. Uh, so to get us to our first um, search interface, I'll just type in Congress. And you'll see that it brings up um, uh, all the women who have ever served in Congress. Um, this uh, search interface is a pretty basic one. It gives you uh, the list of whatever search uh, query you've done. Um, and you can see that uh, it gives you each name, uh, race, party, roles, and the state that they're from. You can also search an individual. Uh, so let's search Senator Maisie Hirono. And I'll show you what an individual page looks like. So if you click on uh, Senator Rono's page, you'll see that you get her race, ethnicity, her party, and her location. You'll also get, uh, uh, get to see the uh, offices that she has held uh, that we include in our database. So she was a lieutenant governor, state representative, U.S. representative, and a U.S. senator. Uh, one thing I will note about the individual page, um, if an office holder has held an office that we don't include in the database, you won't see it here. So, for example, if they're a mayor, if they were an appointed statewide uh, uh, executive, you won't see it. Um, so let's just go back to the search interface here, and I will give you a rundown on this uh, gray box here, which is kind of your main search interface where you can customize your searches. 
Um, so you see you have the, the main search here, but then uh, underneath that you can filter by date, and we have two options here. So most of the search interfaces will be defaulted to currently in office. That tends to be the most popular search for people. Um, you can also toggle to show all years. We have two different search interfaces, um, excuse me, search filters um, for showing all years. You can either search served during years, which gives you the list of anyone who uh, served at any time during that year. So for example, if you were to search for someone in 2017 um, and they only served maybe until April, you would still get them included in this list. Um, so just clear that out. If you wanted to uh, get a final end of year list, you would do it by served at end of year. You can just click any one of these uh, years and you would get that. Um, you'll see in our footnote here, the reason that we included that one is because a lot of our uh, historical numbers, the end of year number is kind of the, the uh, say all number uh, for that particular year. And you can use that one uh, for regression and um, it'll let you know um, the trend line for, for certain things. Uh, Chelsea, that, you'll see. Chelsea, can I interrupt? I'm sorry. Um, just a quick question um, from our friend Anna Mahoney. So what roles are not included on the individual page? If you would just maybe go back to that briefly. Sure, sure. So uh, like one of these, you'll see Alma Adams, she was a state representative and a US representative. So um, the roles that wouldn't be included are anything that don't fall under the purview of our database. So our database includes all congressional offices, all statewide elected executive offices, and all state legislative offices. So like I said before, so if they're you know, um, an attorney general in New Jersey that's an appointed position that wouldn't be included here. Um, also, if they were any kind of municipal, uh, held any municipal office that wouldn't be included. Um, so mayor or council or any kind of like state board or anything like that. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Um, so going back to it, so level of office, like I said, was uh, we have federal Congress, statewide executive, state legislative, uh, state legislative and also territorial DC. Uh, which gives you uh, information about women who serve um, in the state territorial legislatures and the DC City Council, as well as gubernatorial positions uh, within that. If you want to be even more specific, you can go down to position and you can click any one of these um, and get that if you want to know, you know, who the state printer was in, I believe, Kansas <laughs> uh, a couple of years ago, <laughs> you can get that here. Um, uh, or you can pick, you know, a couple of different, if you wanted to know the governors and lieutenant governors, you could also choose that here, uh, you know, for 2017, it would show you. Below that, you can get uh, more specific by doing a particular state. We have all 50 states as well as uh, the territories and the District of Columbia. Uh, you can do race and ethnicity, and you can also do party. So that's kind of our main search. Uh, and, I'll, and we'll move on now to some of our more specific search pages, which gives you more um, uh, context and a little, uh, some more graphics that you can use. So the first is by position. Uh, this, like I said before, it uh, defaults to currently in office, and this gives you just our current numbers. Um, so you see 101 women uh, serve as U.S. representatives, 26 serve as U.S. senators. Um, and this is great for calculating numbers kind of on the fly. If you want to look at the number of, you know, black women that serve in Alabama right now, you could search it and you would get that. And that'll show you. So you see the tables up here, but then you also get the detailed list below. Um, you could also um, look at uh, a state story over the years. So let me just clear those filters. You can also clear the filters by clicking reset right here. So if we wanted to look at, for example, uh, the state of Nevada, you can just start typing Nevada, and you can see their current office holding. Um, Nevada right now is the only state that has over 50% in their legislature. Um, but if you were curious about how they did, I don't know, 40 years ago, you could go to show all years, served at end of year, and see how they did in 1980. Press select. I see a slightly different story in 1980. <laughs> you can get a, a different sense of where the, the progression of the state, uh, is the progression linear, is it kind of going up and down, uh, gives you a bunch of different ways to look at it. Uh, so the next uh, search interface we're going to look at is race and ethnicity. This view gives you a pie chart um, and it shows uh, different race codes as a proportion of all women office holders. Uh, so you'll look down and see some of our categories. Our categories mostly um, mirror the categories that are used in the U.S. Census. Uh, the one difference is that we include the category of Middle Eastern North African. That's not a current U.S. Census category. Uh, it's been in the mix for uh, a couple of years, um, but we decided to get ahead of the curve on that one. 
Um, you'll also see that there's uh, two other categories here. One uh, other, which is um, a woman of color who identifies as a woman of color, but doesn't necessarily identify under these categories. And also you'll see unavailable. Uh, unavailable just represents any woman that we weren't able to get race codes for. Um, we have full race codes for uh, congressional and, and uh, statewide executive um, uh, offices, office holders back until, you know, beginning of time. You will see if you do some more historical searches for state legislative that um, they become more unavailable uh, around the mid-90s and any further you go than that. Uh, we're working on trying to see if we can get some of those codes together, but currently that's where it is right now. You'll also see that we have multiracial as a category here. Um, in the table here and also in the pie chart, any woman who identifies as either um, exclusively multiracial or has more than one race code um, gets included under multiracial. However, if you wanted to get a more detailed look at those women, you could search multiracial and you'll see you get descriptive uh, race codes here. Uh, and that also shows up in the export, which Kelly will talk about in a little bit. So uh, some of the stories you can tell with this um, filter um, are, you know, how have women of color been doing over the last, uh, you know, since 1893. <laughs> so um, federal Congress and statewide executive, we have full codes for, so those are easier to search on this page. Um, and if we wanted to, so that's where, um, the, those are all-time uh, all numbers, excuse me. So if you wanted to look at currently in office, you would just toggle to currently in office. You can see the progress where we're at right now. And you can also, if you were curious, go back to, you know, eight years ago, 1960, see how we were then. You can see it's certainly a different picture back in 1960. Um, so you can see how far we've come, see how far we have to go. Uh, the next page that we'll talk about is by party. Uh, this one's pretty simple. It shows you exactly what you think it's, you're going to get. <laughs> it has our party breakdown. Uh, just like on the race page, uh, it has a pie chart as well as a table. You hover over the pie chart, you'll get the raw numbers as well as the percentages. You'll see that Chelsea. we have, um, yeah. Chelsea, so sorry. Another good okay. question about, um, from Anna, <laughs> is a reminder yeah. of where the race codes come from. Are they all self-identification? <laughs> or do, are yeah, they also so what our, they put on a form? So our um, process for uh, race identification is um, self-identification through either um, contacting the legislator directly or getting that information from uh, biographical or news articles where they give interviews uh, and say kind of plainly what they're, what they identify as. Um, but I would say the bulk, especially in state legislative, the bulk is uh, self-identification. Um, so you can see why it's harder for us to get the ones from 1930. <laughs> they're, they're not around for the self-identification, but we are working on it. And, um, and related so, to that, Chelsea, I'm so sorry. Related to that, people, so we have a question about, is there a code book that's gonna be able to be downloaded, which I know you um, were working we on somewhat, but. Yeah, we don't have a specific code book right now, um, but we will uh, put together one as the database goes out um, so that we can get a better sense of what it is that people are needing a code book for. <laughs> um, but right. yeah, we are working. There. Thank you. Sure. Um, so yeah, so for party, you'll see that we have, it's basically any party that any woman office holder has represented uh, in their time of office holding. Um, and currently in office, you'll see we have Democrat, Republican, nonpartisan, independent, uh, third party. You'll see we have Partido Nueva Progresista and Partido Popular Democratico, which are the two major parties in Puerto Rico. Um, uh, this gives you the story of partisanship uh, among women um, uh, historically. So um, one search you could do, you know, back to 1910 uh, and see what state legislator, how state legislators were doing back then. Um, and let's see what we have there. You see, we hit full parity in 1910. Unfortunately, it was only among two women. So uh, still some work to be done uh, in 1910. Uh, our next and last search interface is by location. Uh, this is, um, this search interface is a little bit different than the other ones that we have um, because this gives you proportion, women as a proportion of all office holders. Um, so if you look at our map here, it's, a, it's in the heat map and you'll see the key down here. And you can see if you hover over any of the states, you get the numbers as well as the percentage. Um, you can also switch it between levels of office. Um, if you go to state legislative, you can see what I was talking about earlier, Nevada being the only one um, uh, over 50% right there. Um, some 
uh, quirks about this page are that because we do this as a percentage of all office holders, this page only goes back to 1975. This, the, the searches on this page only go back to 1975 as we work to get the office to, uh, totals from before then, um, as well as statewide executives. Uh, when you search that, you will see that you get um, a blank map, but you do get the counts. The reason for the blank map is that's another thing that we're working on is like a phase two of, of the database is to get um, the office totals for statewide executive. It's a bit of a moving target because those positions uh, get abolished, they get um, become appointed, they become elected, and they go back and forth. So uh, that's another one we're working at. Um, but this one um, is great for doing uh, percentages for Congress to get context of, you know, California has 19 women elected, but still Nevada is doing better percentage wise when you look at, you know, even though it's 19 versus four. So even though these searches only go back to 1975 and um, statewide executive gives you a blind map, you can do searches by state um, back to 1893 on any one of the search interfaces. So um, the search interfaces, even though you're looking at by position, by race, ethnicity, by party, you can do the, the searches are completely flexible. You can look at them on any one of them. Um, so that's basically the overview of our database. Again, if you have any questions, you can always email me. I'm always happy to talk about the database. <laughs> um, and I will switch it over to Kelly. I'll just stop sharing my screen for a second. I'll switch it over to Kelly and she'll give you uh, an overview of kind of uh, the researcher point of view and so how you can do exports. Thank you so much, Chelsea. All right, I'm going to try to, I can't multitask, so let me just share my screen. <laughs> um, and so, first of all, thank you to Chelsea again and again um, for uh, this database. Uh, and thanks to all of you for joining today's webinar. As a political scientist who studies women in politics, I, like many of you, have long relied on COP, COP data. And that makes this launch even more exciting because I know that many of my colleagues have for many years emailed us to get you know, runs of our data, to get them in Excel format and whatever else so that you didn't have to be inputting data by year by year. This way you can actually get the database in a publicly available way and in a downloadable way. And so that's what I'm gonna focus on, which is how do you export the data for your use in more detailed research and analyses? I'm going to start with how you set up an account um, and you need to do that in order to download the data and then I'll conclude with, as Jean mentioned, how you can save searches for future use. It just saves you a little bit of time if you keep going back to some of the same things that you're looking for. Um, so if you're on the main screen, let me make this a little larger. Um, of the website, um, you can get to the, the login or the register from any search so say position and you choose either download or save search you're going to have the option to register or log in if you've already logged in obviously you can do it that or you already have a login you can do it that way i'm just going to set up a new account just as an example for you all um, and then show you what the screen looks like after you've put in your username and your password i'm doing this just see sort of how the screen comes up. We are going to ask you obviously to put in your name. Um, and then if you could also put in one thing that's not required in addition to state um, and zip code is your type of user. And so we're very curious about who's using our database. And so if you could just let us know which category fits you best, that gives us a sense of who's using the database. So once you've created an account, it'll say registration successful, very easy uh, for you to then continue on in the searches you might have already started. Um, you can also see that what happens on the top of your screen is you now have a My Account tab. And that'll come back later because that's where your safe searches are going to live. So just know that that means you're signed in. You can always log out and change accounts if you, if you keep se several or somebody else is using your computer. Um, so once you're signed in, you can download the data and let me start with a search that many of you may be interested in to just show you how the export works. So what I'm going to do, um, like Chelsea did a little bit, is I'm going to 
show you how to get every woman who served in the US Congress and how I would go about it. So I'm starting from the position page, um, but as Chelsea mentioned, you could start from nearly any other search. Um, and I'm gonna search all years because I wanna include all of the women who've ever served. And there's two options you could move forward with. One is to choose women who've ever served in Congress from the level of office. When you search that specifically, it's gonna show you every woman who served as a US delegate, US representative, and US senator. As many of you know, in media and in research, we often will exclude the delegates from our count of women who are currently in Congress, um, or who historically served, um, or, or at least explain or position them separately because they're non-voting members of the US Congress. So if you wanted to do that, the easier way to do that, instead of using the level of office, is to use the position search tool. So there you can specify more what positions you'd like to include in your search. So I want to look only at those who served as US Senator or US Representative. Now you're gonna get just those numbers. So 318 women have ever served as a US representative. 57 women have ever served as a US Senator. But as many of you know, women have served as both. And so one important number that you'll also be interested in is this unique individuals uh, number. That's gonna tell you women served in either or both capacity. So 359 women have ever served in Congress. Those 359 women are listed below, and so you can search through them as Chelsea has shown you. You can go to their individual pages and get more information on them. Uh, but many researchers are gonna want this in a, a more manipulable format. And so how do you then download this list? It's very easy. You go to a bright red button that says download, um, choose download as a CSV. It will export the data to your computer. I'm gonna kind of skip ahead and show you um, I've already downloaded that file <clears throat> and show you what is included. So here are just a couple of things to note. Um, this includes women office holders listed um, by year. So it's individual by year. You can see this here just, for example, with Bella Abzug. For every year that she served in Congress, you're going to get a separate row. Um, this is how most researchers would use this data anyway. Uh, so we want it to be consistent with that so that you could al allow for matching of different variables by year. I should also note that in the export, which you don't have in the public facing website, is the unique ID for every woman. And that means that you can then easily collapse and search um, in order to get the total number of unique women serving in a year or serving over time, excuse me. Um, and then again, easily match on that unique ID. Um, other variables included in the export are party, uh, position, and of course, since you're doing individual by year, you'll see when those positions change if somebody serves in multiple uh, offices during this time period. State and district and racial and ethnic identification. I should also note that district will change if the woman's district changed because of sense, the US census and uh, redistricting, you'll see that that matches to the years they served. Um, racial and ethnic identification is one other note that I wanna explain based on Chelsea's um, presentation earlier. Uh, this is another way in the export that you can get more specificity about an individual's racial and ethnic identification, particularly if they identify as multiracial. As Chelsea noted, those multiple racial IDs will be reflected in this column of race and ethnicity in your export. So it will include both multiracial and then it will list those separate uh, and individually uh, self-identified race and ethnic codes in this same column. Many of you might want to split them up, um, but it's easily searchable, sortable, and can be split up depending on how you want to work with that race and ethnicity data. But it is all in the export, so you don't have to worry about not losing data or something uh, if you want to be more specific with women who identify as multiracial. One point on that, um, that's going to be particularly useful for those of you who want to give counts of, for example, the total number of Black women who have ever served in office. Um, so if you look at the race um, and ethnicity page and you see a count uh, that includes multiracial, but some of those women among the racial IDs 
uh, identify as black, you can come to the export or go to those lists that Chelsea, the public facing list that Chelsea was noting and do a count of women who identify as black among those uh, multiple races and give you an overall count um, for any black woman who's ever served in Congress, for example. Um, so that's useful, another way in which to get the data in this format. The last thing I just wanted to say about the exports um, is that these exports only include unique cases, the unique cases that are within your search parameters. So just to be very careful that whatever you filtered on the search page is also filtered in the export that you're going to get. So if you filtered from 19 to the president, you're not going to see the years that that woman served prior to 1990. So just be careful about knowing what you searched and just broaden your search parameters if you want the larger, um, most inclusive selection of women office holders. In fact, if you took off all of the um, search parameters and filters, you could effectively get our full database, um, which will take a little time to download, but um, is doable if that's easier for you to sort on your end. And of course, this all this data can be imported into whatever program that you're most comfortable with. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to point to was how to save a search. Um, so let me go back to just that search I was showing you about um, all women in, con uh, in the U.S. Congress. Sorry, who's ever served. Once that search comes up um, and the results are within the parameters that you'd like to save, um, you're just going to go search. You're already signed in. You can do whatever you'd like. So I'm just going to say women who have ever served in Congress. You can put a description in if it's more particular than that. Save that search. And now whenever you go to my account, you will have a list of saved searches. You can always remove one. But you can also click on the save search at any time so that you can go back and update your numbers. This is especially useful if you have a publication or a data point on your website or something you wanna keep revisiting and updating over time, you can come back to our database at any point and just check that your data is most up to date by going to your safe search. It will rerun that search on any updates that we've made in the database and give you the most up to date numbers. So that's quite helpful for many of us who come back to some of the same data points over time. Um, and so, the last point I want to make, um, so that's how you save your searches and export your searches. It's one last point to, especially to researchers and media who are using uh, the database. Uh, we are extremely excited to share it with you, happy to provide this data in a more accessible format. All we ask in return from you is to credit us for it. So we've included a citation on our about page, which you can see here. And just note that there is a longer citation for those of you who might use it in the academic sense um, and an in-text citation for those just citing the database uh, out in the world or in text in scholarly publications. So thank you so much and, and I look forward to hearing some questions that you have and I'll toss it back to Jean. Thank you, Kelly. And while you have your screen up, we do have a few questions, but can you also toggle over to the, the frequently asked questions page just so people you know see that it's there? Um, just so you all are aware, there are these uh, questions are on there. And then also we are recording this webinar and we'll post that on this page. But you can, of course, always reach out to us. And by us, I mean really Chelsea <laughs> to ask specific questions about the database at any time. Um, but we had a couple of questions that I wanna make sure. A good question on any idea how quickly the database will be updated following each election cycle. Did you wanna take that, Chelsea? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it varies a little bit level to level. Um, our kind of regular update um, status for, for the database is that congressional is pretty much the day after that person gets uh, sworn in. Um, statewide is, um, we try to keep it as close as possible. Some of those statewide positions sneak in, but <laughs> we, try, we update that as much as possible. Um, and then a state legislative is done on a monthly basis. Um, as far as uh, during election years, uh, congressional and statewide will be uh, essentially probably the day or the day after or the two days after they get sworn in. Um, so it's pretty quick. State legislative is a, kind of a twofold update. Um, sorry, uh, state legislative uh, will be updated office holder 
wise um, pretty quickly after it's usually in the middle of January um, when we get our first update. Um, the second part of it, though, is the uh, race codes. We have to contact all of the new office holders, so that can take some time, um, but we will update them on a rolling basis as we get that information back. Um, and once we've kind of, you know, gotten as many as we can and have updated it on our fact sheets on our website, um, we will put an update on our homepage uh, that will tell you that we kind of have full race data at that point. So that's about the schedule. Thank you, Chelsea. Mm -hmm. And another question about state legislative leadership roles, or actually I shouldn't say state ledge, I added that piece of it. I think record, you know, of leadership roles in general. Sure. Yeah, so that's actually um, the... There are two things that we are kind of really excited to add to the database in the future. Um, the first being legislative leadership um, data historically. So we have that list. Um, we just have to do the work to kind of integrate it into the database. Um, uh, so that would be for state legislature as well as for Congress uh, leadership positions. Uh, as far as uh, committees, that's the other part of it. Um, we are going to uh, try to add congressional committees uh, also as part of um, something that you can search in the database, um, but probably not state legislative committees because that historically is kind of a hard thing to wrangle. <laughs> um, but uh, state legislative leadership, congressional leadership, and congressional committee uh, membership. Um, well, uh, congressional committee membership and chairs is something that we're working towards. And Chelsea, just to add, some of that information is available on our, for current office holder on our website already. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, absolutely. So another great question about, and I, the specific question is about an effort in the future to include other variables like religious affiliation. Um, but I know we've also had some conversations about some things we'd like to include. So maybe we can't make any promises about what we will include and when we will be able to do it. But I do know we are, there are things that we are thinking about. So maybe, you know, both of you or you, Chelsea, can start us off. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Our, our, our first was to something out that we could then feel uh, it's easier to add variables into. Um, so this is like the big major first step in that. Um, and then, you know, kind of getting it through its first couple of months of being out and then saying like, okay, what's, what, what else can we add? Because now we have this great framework. Um, what other kind of variables can we add? So we've uh, talked about um, uh, previous occupation. We've talked about um, LGBTQ um, identification. Um, uh, we've also talked about religion. Um, so as Jean says, no promises <laughs> on any of this, but this is really the jumping off point that allows us to even have those conversations. So we're really excited about it. And if I could add one thing on that is that the way that, so Ch Chelsea mentioned already how we get to our racial and ethnic identification. Uh, many of the variables that people are interested in would also require that same sort of self-identification. So obviously, <laughs> religious identification, LGBTQ, gender identity. Um, so we're in the process of sort of piloting this with, um, with some folks to see if we could get that information um, and see how comfortable they are with sharing it. Um, and that will also be part of what, we, what and how much we can expand in the database to be sure we're getting accurate information. And we had um, a, a great comment from uh, Angeline Dean, who I know is a friend of COPS, about using the term Caucasian and mm -hmm. making the choice not to use that term. And so I had said, you know, in, in the Q&A, I had answered, obviously, that we're somewhat tied to the census categories. Um, but there is, you know, this is part of an ongoing conversation. I know we always have conversations internally, not just about that, but about many of these terms. And so maybe, I don't know, if either one of you wants to to talk about that, um, you know, even just what we would do internally. I mean, for now we're using white slash Caucasian, if this is something that we would ever change. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think just to, to your point, Jean, that, that obviously we had been reliant on the census. That's the way that we have asked this to individuals. So again, because you're doing self ID, you're also um, using the code that they selected. So we have to be careful about just changing it retroactively. But I think going forward, as Chelsea mentioned, we made a choice to to uh, yeah. beyond the census and include um, the Middle Eastern North North African category because it seemed sort of ridiculous to us not to have that included uh, when we knew many women.
identified in that way, also identified as women of color. Um, and so when we were looking at the racial and ethnic diversity of our office holders to count uh, women like who identify in that way as white just because that's how the census does it was a problem. So we're always coming across and really welcome to uh, changes in this. So I really, Angeline, hello. Um, and we appreciate that comment. And, you know, we're always having these conversations. So we'll definitely keep that um, and pay attention to that and see if there's a way to deal with that um, either in our description um, or moving forward. Thank you. And this is a great question about if you're interested in first time female candidates, is this a database you could use? So what should you do? So this is um, this current uh, database is an office holder only database. Uh, we we are working on um, releasing a database in a slightly different format of uh, congressional candidates, statewide executive candidates, and also state legislative candidates. Um, Kelly can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not, I don't remember all the years they all start up, but it's around 1990, 1992, 1994, uh, depending on what uh, level of office you're looking at. Um, so that will become available uh, in the future, just um, uh, not in the same context as the women office holder database at this time. And one thing to note for those of you who are looking for candidate data today um, is that you can find that data uh, especially, for example, the women running for office this year on COP's election watch page. Um, you'll see a 2020 candidate summary, and then you'll also see um, a link that says past candidate information. And you can go year by year, find a full candidate list, um, find summary information, our press releases and analyses, analyses for women in those years, and a whole host of other uh, data that is available. And then if there's specific data that you're looking for, you can always reach out to us, to Chelsea, to myself, mm -hmm. uh, to Daniel. And we have obviously a candidate database from which we can send you specific searches or queries. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a great question about, you know, this might not be possible. We know it's not possible, but is there a way to tell the first time a woman ever held public office? And, you know, as, as we would be, I mean, I can answer that and say, we'll never know for sure, because there may be somewhere, some locally elected person that none of us, you know, has heard of. But um, I will tell you from doing some research on this, um, out of curiosity, there was a woman, I think, elected Register of Deeds in Massachusetts in like 1850 something, which you wouldn't find in our database. Um, but, um, you know, so it is, it, this goes a long way to telling you the first woman elected statewide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would yeah, say unfortunately, that what's very funny about the first woman elected is I, people have made this claim about. So, depending on what state or locality you're from, you'll hear that that was the first woman ever. That's right. elected. Um, so it's very hard for us to to then verify everybody who says they're the first, but uh, certainly if we could figure it out, we will. Yeah, there are some great stories of some of the very first women who must have been formidable. They ran for office back in the 1850s. So if there's a question, could we clarify, if you save a search of all members of the house by party, and when you go into your save searches and click on that search, it will automatically update to include the numbers for a new Congress and you can download the new data set. That's correct. Yeah. But yeah, but again, if you're looking at, so for example, if you filtered in that search by party, so you only have the Democrats, you just need to remember <laughs> that that search may excluded some people and you can always go back to so it's under again uh, under the search click on it um, and when you go back to that search you'll see on the left hand side what you filtered right so you can always um, be sure of what is included and what isn't and then re-download a new file So I think, I, I hope I didn't miss any. That's always my fear. Um, I think we got through all of the questions in Q&A. If anybody has any final questions, now is your opportunity. Although, as I said, you can always reach out to us at any time. We are happy to answer questions. We want this to be useful. And uh, so we welcome you know all of your feedback also would be helpful. So feedback and questions, please reach out to Chelsea. If you are a journalist and you have media inquiries, you can reach out to Daniel and, um, you know, and obviously the rest of us are available anytime. 
And so again, thank you all so much. And thank you to Chelsea for all of her work on this database and then walking us through it. And thank you to Kelly for all of her work on the database and walking us through how do you download and you know use the information as a researcher. And with that, we will end this webinar and we look forward to being in touch with all of you. Thanks everyone. Take care.